Uh, just to reiterate what Dan said, if you've got any questions, then please put them in the uh, in the Q and A panel or engage in chat throughout the session because uh, this is your chance to get involved as well. Leading today's discussion is going to be David Hall, who is Regional Director for the National Farmers Union in the region and Chairman of the Lancashire Enterprise Partnership Food and Farming Subgroup. We're also joined by Bruce Greve, who is uh, Director of eAgri Sensor Centre, which is easy for me to say, at the University of Manchester. Um, so first up, David, I just wondered if you could give us an overview, really, of the challenges around agricultural innovation and why it's such a key theme for you and the NFU. Yeah, cheers, Ben. Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, to join you all today. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. Um, well, I think I'd like to uh, to start, Ben, I think you have a little bit of introduction to myself as well. Um, I've been with the NFU just over five years now. I'm uh, a sheep farmer from um, just not in the South Pennines. Uh, we are in, in Saddleworth, but class ourselves as being in Lancashire and, uh, and hang on to that. Um, I have a background in supply chain management in, in previous work and was also uh, a tutor at Myerscore College. So real heart and uh, an association with the farmers across Lancashire and really uh, fought for the cause for Lancashire food and farming to be recognised as a key sector within the Lancashire Lab. So it was really important for us to be able to um, to push that up, up the agenda and the importance, as we said, of the food and farming sector to be recognised within the local industrial strategy with the LEP. So we, we championed, we've worked with the LEP closely for the last two to three years alongside uh, the team at Myersco. And as we said, as you mentioned, fortunately, I was asked to, um, to chair a food and farming group for the LEP, which is really key for us to be able to drive the, the opportunities uh, for the sector. So really pleased about that and give a little, little bit of background of why we uh, feel that it is so, so important. Um, Agriculture is uh, facing such a challenging, potentially challenging time with uh, two things coming together in relation to um, leaving the European Union, which is around uh, the development of new agricultural policy that the farmers will have to, uh, have to work within. Um, and as part of that, there will be the uh, reduction in, uh, or the, the change in the way that farmers will re receive support very much around the payment for public goods, and therefore need to drive and look at the way that they can drive uh, productivity within their business, which very much sits alongside the, uh, the objectives of the local industrial strategy. So really keen to see that the ways that innovation um, can, can help support the farmers to drive productivity within their business. And that drives into so many other agendas around um, net zero, reducing their carbon impact, uh, as well as driving the businesses forward. So I see that it is a real opportunity um, to be able to do this. And in a way, uh, the timing being right of that driver for change being around what's happened uh, around Brexit and also then looking at the market to ensure that farmers and food producers are producing the products that our consumers want, uh, again, with the potential changes uh, with access to the European market. And again, global opportunities to supply our products around the world will hopefully come from, from trade deals. So, so a real time of change for the, for the, uh, for the sector, Ben, and really looking at ways that uh, the innovation can help address some of the challenges, stroke opportunities and grasp the opportunities that the, uh, that the food and farming sector, uh, sector are facing quite shortly. Thanks, David. And I think you, you raised some really good points there around innovation and the change in nature of uh, agricultural policy reform as well. And I think we'll, we'll come back to that shortly. But Bruce, can you just give us an overview of, uh, and an insight into how this agri-tech agenda feeds into to your work at the university? Yeah, sure. Um, I probably should give myself a bit of context as well. Um, I'm not a farmer. I'm actually a widget man. I'm an engineer. Um, so I worked for 20 years or so with the agri-science business, Syngenta. Uh, and so they actually I ended up with all the red braces people in, uh, in Basel, in Switzerland, looking at uh, business offers. And so what we started doing was like saying, what could we do with low cost sensing, informatics, all the artificial intelligence sort of ideas, you know, your mobile phone technologies and these sorts of things. Um, around agriculture. This is back in 2007. So the reason I now sit in, in Manchester, in fact, live in the Yorkshire Pennines at the moment, so it's the other side of the hill, but I can still see Lancashire from over there, um, is, um, is, is basically to produce um, low-cost um, instrumentation, which um, can then go, become part of integrated offers around the farming environment. Now, we, we still work with Syngenta, but we work with lots of other companies as well now, and Part of the, the linkage to the, the Lancashire uh, area is not just the fact that I'm, I'm sat in Manchester these days, 
it's also um, around um, how we can work with the, the, the rural colleges uh, and actually get a whole infrastructure together about how we can get new technologies into, into the region. Uh, hence why the discussion was with the, the likes of uh, Myoscope. Um, so around that, um, I'm, from the university environment, we've started spinning out companies um, in the agri-tech area to start delivering on this. It's all very well to be in a university, but um, it's, um, you know, you can only take the research so far, you need a commercial vehicle, and that's where we're trying to go now, actually trying to actually get some of these, uh, these approaches out. So coming round to where the innovations are. I mean, so, so, so Ben, what was your, your angle again? Just <laughs> forget the question there. Well, just, I mean, you've given a good overview there of, of some of the, the work that you're doing um, uh, at the university and just, just your view really of innovation and the... Hmm. Yeah, I think the, the, the one thing that's been missing in the agri-tech area, and it's starting to get the awareness now, and it's only just starting, is what we've seen in the medical domain. You know, we've, we've had engineers over, you know, eons, basically, looking at medical devices. Um, now we're starting to see engineers waking up to the idea that they should be working with bioscientists, uh, working with the farming community, and actually working out how you can bring the whole lot together. And that's very much where we sit um, in Manchester. We, we, we very much um, partner with the, 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 the plant science, the farming community, to try and understand what the problems are and the context there. We're just a bunch of engineers, but you know, we can build anything. You just gotta tell us what it is. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's, that's really where the innovation comes, I think, is actually across that divide. Great stuff. And David, from, from your perspective, you, you were talking there around, we've obviously got huge change coming in terms of Brexit, in terms of uh, potential new British agricultural policy. I mean, do you think there's capacity within that to, to try and drive innovation at a farm level and the adoption of it, essentially? Yeah, I think I do think there is, Ben. I think that we um, the businesses look to be able to uh, develop their um, profitability and maintain levels of profitability and address some of the challenges that are coming. So one of the areas is a, is a real challenge is access to non-UK labour. So Lancashire is a county. I always say that Lancashire county that can feed itself from the grade one land that we have in West Lancashire and the horticultural business there through the, uh, the file and the plains with the dairy production and up into hills with the uh, with livestock and beef and sheep guys. But a particular challenge around West Lancashire is access to labour. And therefore, is there an opportunity to be able to use technology to be able to take away some of those jobs, to be able to reduce uh, the demand and requirement for labour there? And is there an opportunity to, to, uh, to train people and again, I think one of the areas that we would like to see developed is, we, I think, as, as Bruce said, we have some amazing um, engineering businesses and sectors across Lancashire. And is there actually technology in one sector that maybe, to a certain extent, well, they have also got it. They have the IP. They're not keen for another um, sort of player within their sector to have it. But actually, is there something that could be used in a different sector? So is the technology in aerospace, for example, that could be being used to help the guys in horticulture? And again, can we do something to be able to increase that pace of transfer to be able to get things done? Is in effect, can we take the industry forward in five years that generally may take 10 years by using some of that knowledge and expertise that's there? So I do see that the, um, I suppose they do say sort of out of adversity opportunity and innovation comes that in effect, these challenges will then become real and therefore they've got to look for solutions. So I think there are some potentially you could say big ticket items that need to be that need to be addressed, and other opportunities there for uh, robotics, maybe to be able to uh, to help some of those things. And are there other areas that are maybe more around the incremental gains that could be made, um, very much around a potential da data sh data information using data more effectively? And I see that as a as a livestock farmer. How can we get that extra sort of kilo that's there? Um, and very much, I'd like to talk a bit about productivity later, Ben, if I can. But in fact, how, how can we get more, more from less and can we use the technology and data that is there and actually work much smarter rather than in effect they're running, running faster to stand still? There is that a, a, a mugs game. But are the ways that actually we can, um, uh, uh, again, for me, help to deliver uh, towards net zero is by being smarter and in effect get more from less. And that, I think, I don't think there's a silver bullet but actually looking at potential for these uh, 
incremental gain. So I think in a way, Ben, sorry, the change in policy, I think will drive the, uh, the demand and, and requirement to do these things. We've got to look for novel uh, solutions, but my hope is that some of the solutions are already there and we could take them from other parts of industry uh, and move them uh, and move them across. And we're seeing that maybe from technology that's come from uh, in the production of crops and cereals, the way that we manage the soils in relation to managing cereals and nutrients and taking that into grassland management uh, and managing in effect fields within fields and using technology to do that. So yeah, in a way, I, thought, I hope I answer your question, Ben. It's around. I'm hoping that the um, some of the challenges that we've faced, we've got we've got to grasp this uh, grasp this nettle, and I'm hoping that innovation and see that innovation will be a key part of delivering that. And Bruce, from your perspective, then do you do you think there's other sectors we can learn from, other sectors we can take technology from, and and apply into agriculture? And is there any examples maybe that you're doing or that you're aware of of where that's happening? Yeah, certainly. And um, as, as David says, it's, it's not just around, obviously, across sectors. It's also across the country. Um, in Lancashire, we, we, can, uh, we can translate a lot of the technologies that may be developed in some of the other regions um, and take them into our context. And that's very much where we should be going. Um, in fact, does this thing actually allow you to share a screen? Just not of interest. Um, I think... Uh, yeah, with me, Bruce, and I'll set that up for you. Yeah, you need to do multiple shares. So this, this, this was pertinent when you said about um, labour, um, uh, David, because um, it's a very, very short video, and I'll, uh, it's probably one you have to show about three times to actually get it through, but I'll just um, uh, see if I can get us to share. You have a link for the video. Is it online or? Oh, no, it's okay. I can just show it here. It's, um, it's, it's, it's very, very oh, I can put it online if you want. Um, right. So hopefully you don't get some cheesy music with this, but basically uh, what we did down in, um, in Cambridgeshire was um, look at smart weed control. Now this, what we'll see very, very briefly is little spot sprayers going around at, uh, those letters. Um, yeah, so very, very short that one, but um, what, um, what that's actually showing is, um, it's a robotic technology which is based on a whole series of different uh, pieces of technology which were not, not, not typical within the agri world. So you've got um, uh, an approach called multispectral uh, image processing, which is done by a lot of things like uh, you use it in satellites a lot um, for picking up, I suppose, in agriculture, it's leaf area index and these types of things. But that's been using it very, very close up to pick the, pick the biomass up around a crop. And in this case, it's a lettuce crop. And it's targeting the fact of the tolerance that's been uh, coming into, into herbicides, and in particular uh, in the horticultural sector, where um, for horticultural herbicides, I mean, if you, if you end up with um, some being removed from the, uh, the list of, uh, of registered products, of course, cereals get it first, and horticulture is sort of the, the, the poor relation. So what we're doing there was basically applying high-speed image processing alongside machine learning what it's doing, it actually learns where the, the weeds are around a, a crop and it uses a non-selective herbicide to spot spray. So you get very, very small quantities of chemistry is being put down there with um, very little loss to the, to the field. So it's, it's a sort of game-changing technology compared to going out spraying uh, uh, large areas. Uh, but it only comes together by bringing together lots of, uh, lots of different sectors um, who never would have thought about, well, okay, what can I do with um, a bit of machine learning stuffed on the back of a, uh, of a tractor? So, 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 so that's one nice exemplar, but it's an exemplar that sits now in East Anglia. Um, we are not doing this up in the Northwest. And why not? Open question. And I think that's, uh, that's one of the challenges. And I, I was going to ask you about that, David. Like, you, you know, you're a sheep farmer in... Saddle with as well as your role at the NFU and in others, and you know there is so much technology even in the livestock sector. But how do we, how do we take that from a high level to actually being used in the field? And and is there a change of mindset required around farmers to to engage with that? Um, I think there is a change of mindset, uh, Ben. I think there's also um, new generation, younger generation of farmers that that are coming in that are interested in interested in. Uh, so our breeding technology, wanting more to get more out of the stock. Um, as I said, I, I use that term 
Well, they've managed to stock efficiently, let's say. I think it's using the the, uh, the inputs that they've got effectively. And looking at uh, sort of trusting the uh, the science. I think I'm I'm a big believer in, in knowledge transfer and basically seeing is believing. So when I was at my school, we did a project uh, that was called Monitor Farm. We had farms um, that were hosting events for us and seeing basically expertise going in, looking at some of the areas that they needed to address it on, on the farm. We had a particular farm in Lancashire we worked with, uh, a fantastic family. And he was so supportive in the ideas and basically he did what he was asked to do by the experts that we brought in. And he invested, he invested in his land, he reseeded and improved his grassland. And also looked at the technology around using uh, estimated breeding values for uh, for, his, for his rams, uh, for his, what we what we call tups, um, and basically putting basically I think doing what we asked him to. So a lot of the time these animals don't look the prettiest, and maybe sometimes a lot of the farmers are choosing uh, choosing their rams on how they look um, and what the type of the, the animals that they produce rather than um, relying on the figures to actually say this is how these animals will perform. And that, again, in a way, is, is a change of mindset because a lot of the farmers is within livestock, their pride, their hobby, in effect, is within, within breeding uh, ped pedigree sheep and cattle. But it's actually looking at the figures and, in fact, the, the, the sweet spot is having both, which are, which are good animals that meet all the breed characteristics, but also have uh, good performance characteristics as well. And again, he also then used electronic EID, so all the, all the sheep were EID'd. So he's monitoring the performance of, uh, of all his sheep, looking at the weight of lambs that's, that's produced uh, per ewe. Again, I really got into managing the data and we saw, uh, saw him a, a few months, it's probably a year ago now. He said, how's lambing gone? Have you got rid of your lambs? He said, yeah, so we've got about 25 left. And he said, I said, oh, he said, an interesting, he said 20 of them are from the same top. He said, what have you done? He said, I've sold it. Or he, he said, I've killed it. But basically using the information to drive his business in what he was doing. And I think basically it can become quite addictive in managing the data because again, is the guys are wanting to produce good quality stock and have pride in the quality of stock that they're producing and they're putting a time and effort in. So again, going back, it's key for farmers to go to be able to see that something like that had made the changes within the business. Uh, they'd invested and invested wisely. There are also grant, uh, grant initiatives as the small productivity grant scheme is available to farmers now. To fair, it closes at the end of, uh, I think it's next, I think it's the 4th of, uh, 4th, 5th of November. But basically opportunity now to support. And I think in effect, we need uh, government to give a commitment or DEFRA to continue to support that investment from the farming community um, to drive this forward. And again, is we need this 10 year gain in five years and how can we, uh, we drive some of, that, some of that forward? So I think the, um, the sheep and beef farmers I think, are keen to, uh, to address this stuff. And I think also we will be seeing the, the pull from the marketplace as well and seeing our customers looking for this. You've seen Waitrose come out last week and saying that they will only want to source from farms that are net zero. Uh, is it 2037 or 2040? And again, that's a key ambition for the NFU is for the industry to be um, net zero. I need to be just be sure on the Waitrose date, but again, key that they're, they're recognizing net zero within their supply chain and that farmers are moving that way. So I think there is a, a groundswell then in, in farmers that are looking at the way they're performing on the farms and looking at the way that they're, uh, they're, they're managing the land, managing the soils and making sure that it's there for, uh, for future generations as well. The only challenge is, of course, David, that we've had a uh, blackface sheep sold in the past week for £200,000, which is probably based on uh, how pretty its head is rather than anything else. But there we go. Um, you, you mentioned there about the NFU's uh, net zero agenda and the NFU was committed to getting um, the, the industry towards net zero um, levels by 2040. And I was just wondering if you could explore that theme a bit more for us and, and how the innovation agenda fundamentally ties into that. We, we did a big edition on it recently at Farmers Guardian, which, which actually had a lot of interest, but central to it is, is data and technology and, and, and going on that journey as an industry. It is very much so. There are three pillars really, uh, Ben, to where we see the opportunities for the industry to become net zero. One is around um, driving efficiency and the productivity within businesses. So we said we're using uh, the resources effectively. Um, uh, so in fact, the, the inputs, um, yeah, the inputs that we, we use on farm versus the outputs that we, that we are producing. 
I think that ties into the, the, the comment a little bit around, around productivity doesn't actually mean producing more, it's producing the same from less uh, and finding a market. The other then is actually looking at the way that we um, are sequestrating carbon on farm. And again, the carbon storage that we have within the land and can we actually look to increase that, which could be through, uh, through, tree, through, through tree cover and also through peatland restoration. So there are things that the farmers can actually do uh, within managing the land. And I think, again, areas of innovation there of looking at the, the way that we manage our soils, um, the rise of uh, mint till of the farmers not turning, uh, turning the soil over, some of the challenges of managing uh, some of the weeds that are becoming resistant. Again, maybe innovation there to, uh, to address some of that. But again, looking at the ways that we're managing soils to increase uh, soil organic matter um, and not be depleting soils of nutrients. And then the other, th the third pillar is the opportunity in relation to renewables and looking at the role that land, land managers and farmers can play in relation to, uh, to feeding that market. Um, we see that as huge opportunity um, across the area in relation to, I suppose, a lot of offshore being done in relation to wind, but also then on farm um, around, and it could be around anaer anaerobic digestion, could be around um, wind, hydro. Uh, yeah, so opportunity there that the farmers can play and also producing energy crops on their on the farms as well. So three key pillars to how we see that it uh, that it can be done, and how we can do that do that uh, on the farm. And maybe again the potential for trade in uh, in carbon credits. So a lot of the farms could actually become carbon uh, carbon negative in what they're looking to do. Um, and how do we ensure that they can get some value uh, back onto uh, back onto farm for doing that? But in a way, Ben, it, it does the. Um, the net zero opportunity very much around the um, increasing productivity agenda does, I think, it, I'm going to say it's quite exciting. In fact, how can we manage the uh, the crops better? And in fact, how, for me, for a certain extent, how can I get more kilos of lamb produced from the, for, I only have 100 sheep, but from my sheep that I have, how can I get them better? Can I get them away quicker? And looking at those details of where we are, is it about producing more lambs? No. And again, just for me, when I took over the farm when my father died, we had 300 sheep that probably produced about 330 lambs. Um, I moved to, to clint sheep, started managing them in a different way. We then had 300, uh, we had 200 sheep producing 300 lambs. So again, it was looking at the way that we can start to drive it forward in a way for me, one less mouth to feed, but still continue to produce the same volume of meat. Again, that's a, um, a driver for, uh, for increasing productivity. And getting into those ways, I think, of using innovation using the data to be able to, to identify underperforming sheep, uh, address maybe some of the health issues that are there, uh, taking some of those out, and again, using the advisors that, uh, that are around us. So I see that as being, um, as being quite key to what we're doing, and I think that will be yeah, positive if we can get more farmers doing that, and I think they are, because they're looking at making the, uh, the interest. I think, as you, as you said, um, sheep and livestock prices have been very good uh, this year. They've been, and been very, very strong. I think that, again, is, is when there is a good return. I think that will drive people to look to do better in what they're looking to do. Uh, to be fair, because they will have money to invest, which I think that is, uh, is a positive for the, uh, for the sector. And just touching on that issue of uh, net zero, Bruce, we've been talking about the net zero north um, uh, scheme. And I was just wondering if you could give us a bit of insight into that and, and also your views on, on how that agri-tech can play a role in that net zero agenda. Yeah, it's interesting. Just just following up from from David's comment actually about the um, uh, the net zero in terms of the the region. I mean, if you're looking at things like I think from from a, every uh, case of adversity you get opportunity, don't you? And um, and one of the things that um, if you're looking at with the uh, uh, with net zero, certainly in the the arable world, um, if you've got um, uh, Basically, you've got NGOs like Eat Leaf at the moment that will um, setting up a carbon uh, balance, basically carbon credit, in terms of you know asking farmers to say, well, how much um, diesel, how much um, uh, uh, nitrogen, how much um, other major nutrients are going into the soil, which all have a carbon um, associated with them. What they're not doing is actually um, <laughs> accepting the fact that plants have been pretty good. Up capturing carbon for a very long time. Um, so, so, you know, the equation actually just goes one way. And um, there's, there's opportunity here, because if we can actually use the data that David was talking about, um, so additional sort of monitoring capabilities, which we, we can develop, we know we, know we, have, we, we can head, uh, head that way, we know how to go that way. 
but there's an impetus to do it. What we then have is, is basically do the other side of the, you know, to use the chemical engineering thing, it's a yeah. mass balance. You know, if you actually manage your crop better or manage your livestock better in your grasslands, you're actually capturing carbon. And so you should be using these tools to then say, well, the more efficient um, practices, we monitor which ones are the most efficient and we actually start, um, instead of just being sort of a thing done by leaf as a nice NGO thing that you stamp on the side of a, um, a packet, it actually becomes a meaningful tool where you can actually offer farmers incentives to follow the right routes. And there's, a, there's then a, a route backwards to say, there's a reason why we're doing this. And of course you then go down all the way through the, um, through the chain and say to consumers, well, look, this has been managed in a certain way. We've got traceability all the way down the line that says you've got reduced um, emissions, more, uh, more capture being done by this. So I think a, there are opportunities for businesses uh, everywhere to start um, going down those lines rather than just looking at traditional approaches. Um, so, so, so get off my soapbox there. Um, with respect to the, the net zero north, I mean, there's actually a, um, a, a bid that's been put in uh, along, basically from the Northern Powerhouse, um, alongside the, um, the research intensive um, uh, universities and the rural colleges across the north. Uh, and it's gone to the comprehensive spending review. Uh, it must be, I think, uh, was it Richie Sunak said a couple of days ago, he's only gonna look over 12 months at the moment. You know, you're gonna be a bit more moonshot than that, you know. But anyway, accepting that the world will change. Um, so basically, in fact, I'll just share the screen here, why not? Um, I just, there's a couple of slides about which I'll have a look at. If you can um, see something that says NZN at the moment. So basically, it's, it's, it's gone in and it's basically looking along two streams. Um, first one is, is non-food related, so, or, you know, or not directly anyway, and that's the hydrogen economy. Um, so basically looking at how we can uh, uh, generate hydrogen, how we can use it, uh, both the products and as a fuel uh, stock. Um, so bringing up the, the processing capabilities up in the, the north um, to be able to tackle that challenge. You know, the big um, industries, the sort of our legacy of the likes of ICMA and these sorts of things, um, which um, then brings you into the, the other side of the equation, which is the agriculture and food end. So into there goes a, a, a grow smarter. Um, which is basically very much related to sort of things which um, uh, has been going on with the Lancashire Lep. Uh, it's, uh, it's got all sorts of bits here. So we've got the, the hydrogen part, and we've got the grow smarter part. Um, and so one of the, the angles here, so basically, again, what David was talking about, about working across sectors. So with the grow smarter, um, instead of just producing a food, um, a food stock or a, um, a fiber stock or a feed stock, um, you're looking at the biotech business, basically saying, well, can you actually, if you bring, if you look all the way through the chain, um, can you start valorizing better? And this is basically where we had first conversations, wasn't it? Then we started talking about uh, in the Northwest, could we start doing this? Um, so basically saying, okay, um, using all the industrial biotech capabilities, all the, uh, the new materials, the catalysis that's available in the chemical industry these days, could you start using your farming stock to rather than just producing uh, a better quality lettuce or onion, et cetera, or a better quality grassland, you actually then produce for, yes, you do do that, but you then also produce uh, effectively co-products within, the, um, within the, the, um, the produce, which you could then use the, the biotech end to actually extract. So you're basically getting multiple hits. Uh, I think it was, um, uh, the guys over at uh, Reese Heath were talking about this, that, um, you know, they, they have a situation, I'm sure you get the same actually, David, up in Lancashire, but they were talking about around Cheshire, um, that um, you'll have two dairies um, in a similar area, and they've both got to uh, compete with, uh, with effectively uh, a farming supply chain, and they're both producing the same product. And so, of course, the, the dairy produce then drops in value because it's oversupplied. What you don't do is that, you basically say, okay, well, one of the dairies, I'm not saying you swap it to two ways, but you, you, you basically say, um, well, let's start valorizing. Let's start saying, instead of just overproducing what everyone's producing, let's produce additional value products alongside that and let's start creating the infrastructure around it. And you can imagine uh, uh, you saw the industrial state type, uh, type community coming together, very interesting to 
through, through my sort of history on this sort of stuff, you know, chemical plants used to all uh, be designed uh, in big complexes because one fed the, the, the raw material of one was the, was the output from another. And we should be doing the same in the agri world, get that mindset coming across from elsewhere. So that's part of the thinking that's gone into central government. Who knows what will happen with it now? It's going through Treasury, but um, so, so that's where we've been coming from um, in terms of just general thinking. That's how it's developed. I think the, the stuff we talked to originally in Lancashire Lab. Um, so we'll he, see, see what, uh, what they come back with. Um, so very much looking at new industries and how we can actually uh, help the region and have them right the way across the north, not just, you know, because what we do in Lancashire uh, we will complement what they're doing in Yorkshire. Um, and, you know, we, we should be working like that. So I'll, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox now, but that's, that's basically the thinking that uh, we've had recently in this area. No, thank you, Bruce. We actually have a, a question from Hannah Wright around this issue of, uh, of net zero and climate change. And it's, um, how do you see greenhouse gas emissions being accounted for at the, at the farm scale and the process for reporting farm level emissions? And, sequestration. Um, Bruce, I wonder if you've got a, a view on that, first of all. Um, I think that's really what I was uh, alluding to before. The, so the farm scale, what was the question again? It's basically how would you actually sequester at the farm scale? Yeah, and how do you how do you report that? How do you report farm level emissions and sequestration, which is is it's a big issue for for agriculture. Mm. There is a lot of debate about it, but it's about how do you actually apply it at a farm level and and, mm. and make that work for you. Yeah, well, okay. I'll give you uh, again. Try to avoid the soapbox thing, but I just um, give you some thinking we we've had. Um, it, in the first place, I mean, you can get lots of measurements in controlled environments. Um, easier than the field. You know, the technology will start in that controlled environment first, in the glasshouse type environment. Um, now, if you want to go to the field, then there's um, the, the way we've been thinking is saying, well, let's start um, analyzing what, um, what you need to do in a controlled environment to maximize the biomass production and maximize the capture. Um, and once you've done that in that controlled environment where you can actually put all sorts of sensing machine learning and all the rest around it, um, you can then extrapolate to the field, but only to a certain extent. I mean, the models um, won't be perfect in the first place, but you've got to do the 80-20 rule and start getting something out of this. So in the, in the controlled environment, um, we can do monitoring directly at the root zone, uh, looking at the, you know, the, the whole iceberg thing where you, you, most of your plant is below the ground, but you only see a bit above it. Um, but you can also monitor synchronously in, in, above the ground. That's, that's where we go with a lot of robotic technology and actually showing it in the glass house and the phenotyping environment. So when you do that, then you can start making um, connections between what you can actually monitor above the ground as compared to what you can see below the ground when you've got the complete capability available. Um, so you can then say, okay, well, we'll start bringing in the above ground monitoring system. So the, the, it's everything from your drone mounted to handheld devices to the um, things like the Sentinel satellites where, you know, they uh, pick up large area um, agri features, bring all that data together and start um, creating models that say, Right, well, if you manage it like this, we're seeing these effects above the ground, there's a very good chance you're sequestering in this way um, and managing over larger areas like that. So rather than trying to instrument the hell out of every single plant around every field, which is, um, well, certainly at the moment, currently unviable, um, then there's a halfway house. Thank you, Bruce. David, is that something you just want to come in on as well? Yeah, I will, Ben, if that's OK, because I think some of it is around... Um... I think you mentioned it earlier, really, is the carbon tools are the audits that are done uh, generally, and we say for uh, processors, retailers that are looking to um, to give a, a carbon um, a carbon cost of a product is generally looking purely at the inputs of the product rather than the sequestration on farm. So the NFU are currently working with three different organisations that develop that have got carbon tools to assess your carbon footprint on on the uh, from the holding and really looking to find one or work with them to develop one that truly uh, looks at the sequestration that's on farm. So as you said, in relation to the, uh, the grass being grown, the grass production, the actual soil, the carbon that's locked up in the soil, 
as well as the, equest the sequestration that's done from, from grassland, which may be not just quite as great as some farmers may like it to be, but it definitely does. And grow in effect, growing crops are sequestrating um, uh, carbon. And we also have, as we said, the hedgerows again, and the woody hedgerows that are sequestration as well as the trees. So I think it is really important that we have a, uh, a standard measurement and a way of assessing this on farm that the farmers can create. And again, clear steps that they um, that they can see or measures they need to make to be able to reduce their carbon footprint if if necessary and look to be able to, to improve. And that's beyond, as we said, some of the efficiency gains and productivity gains maybe that could be made. But I think one of the other things that's also important is the way that the uh, government or NGOs or in effect globally, we assess methane which I think is, is one of the challenges. I think there's two schools of thought. One is around, if I'm right, um, GWP star and also GWP 100. And therefore our belief is, is that methane is a, is a, a short lived uh, greenhouse gas, which basically goes up for about eight years, eight or nine years, then gets turned into other products, uh, water, CO2, and then in effect comes back down, goes back into the cycle and is part in effect of the carbon cycle. It's not like other greenhouse gases that goes up and stays in the atmosphere. And therefore, in fact, it's provide, providing the, uh, the, the, the challenge of the burden in, in, the, in the greenhouse gases, as, as some may portray. I think that, in effect, is a challenge with the scientists and the science community uh, globally, is how they do, uh, they do assess methane. Um, so I think, really, it's looking at if uh, methane isn't classed as a, as a long-term gas, the number of cattle that are on the... Uh, on the planet is actually reduced. So there is a big argument in relation to uh, where we are and the impact of, uh, of cattle and I suppose of eating uh, red meat and dairy products is having on the, having on the environment, uh, which is a theory to a certain, well, more than to a certain extent, it's a theory that we don't support. Um, and looking at the way that we do uh, manage and cal calculate methane that's, that's produced on farm. But we also have examples of farmers that are, that are feeding uh, feed additives. They're looking to the way that they can reduce the methane that the cattle are producing, the way that the fed, other uh, innovative or, or no, novel products that could be used to uh, to to address that. We know we have one of our members of Lancashire that's done that, so uh, we see it as being um, being positive. So I think we are working with three different organisations that are developing their models to truly give a, a clear uh, indication on farm of the sequestration that's that's occurring uh, on farm and how they can address it. But I do think there is a bigger discussion in the science community in relation to how we do uh, assess methane uh, and, and if I suppose it value its, uh, its contribution of, I think, I think it's GWP star and GWP 100. Um, and I'm very much of the mind that it is a, um, say a recycled, uh, recycled gas. But again, the other bit as well is I feel from the farming community is it's really positive for us because the only sector in the only industry then effect can sequestrate carbon as well as, as uh, the element that we do produce. So we are an asset. We're working with all the counties. Let's look at most counties have now got ambition to be to be net zero with that, and again to deliver on the government's net zero by 2050. And what what um, part can the farmers play in being able to uh, to help the counties or the region to be able to deliver this? And we see it as real as a real positive opportunity. Um, maybe again we need to be looking at some of the commercial opportunities of this as well. In relation to carbon offsetting, um, and that we have companies, in fact, that can work with partners. So we have an example in Greater Manchester, where Heathrow Airport have invested in uh, Chat Moss in relation to the renovation of the uh, of the peatland there and the mosses to be able to again offset their carbon. And that's really positive for the area in that renovation work that's being done. And obviously uh, Heathrow Airport again saw that as a as a positive for them to be able to invest in that. And there may be uh, maybe more of that going forward. But we need to ensure that there is some. Uh, value in that for the uh, for the farming community if they're uh, they're looking to do it as well. Maybe a long answer to your question, Ben, but I think it is a very valid question that's come forward from uh, from the participants. Yeah, and um, uh, and I think that's that's one of the one of the things one of the questions that, that that's come in uh, around about how do we how do we take that food systems approach? We, we you know there's a lot of stuff in the press at the moment, isn't there? around free school meals around food poverty and it's about how do we you know just striking that balance between technical innovation but also something that is tying back into uh, into everything else which i think is quite a timely timely debate david definitely um just as we we're just drawing towards the end of the session now um david and bruce but you you touched on it before david about producing the same 
from less and that's what you tried to do on your farm it's one of the challenges that we have in global agriculture isn't it producing more if not more from from less available land as we go forward um but for you david does that tie back into that productivity agenda as well that you touched on at the outset and how key is is that for you both in terms of what you do at the nfu your role with the let uh, and just the the industry in general it, it is, Ben. If we look across, um, I suppose, productivity productivity indices, when we looked at the local industrial strategy, we looked to be able to drive productivity. And agricultural food and farming lags behind other sectors. So therefore, for me, that, that gives opportunity. I think I'm really keen to, to state that increasing productivity doesn't mean that we are potentially producing more. Because I think that's one of the challenges is that we need to be able to find markets for product. And a lot of the time we start to think is, right, can we produce something, then we'll find a market for it. But actually, we should be finding the markets and then working back and produ producing products. There are also, and there continue, a lot more mouths to feed on the planet, and there will be in the future. So again, we have got to be mindful of that. But I think now we much more need to be much more mindful, mindful of the resources that we have on farm in relation to the soils that we have, the way that we're managing water and our inputs. I think it was, um, I think it's been said, have we uh, only 100 harvests left? I think it, I think I've read, um, watched a program recently, it was 60 harvests. And I think Michael Gove uh, recently said it was 40 or 50 harvests. To a certain extent, nearly the figure's irrelevant, but the point it's making is we must manage and look after our soils much better in the future, maybe, than we have in the past. And therefore, I think that is key in relation to doing that uh, in a way that we can do that productively. And I think this is the ration rather than just pushing more and more and more nearly sod the consequence, but it's actually how can we manage the resources that we've got efficiently as possible and continue to produce the levels of food. And, and maybe potentially in the right place that could be producing more, but it's not more at any cost and it cannot be as run, in effect, like I said, running faster to, faster to stand still. And this is where I think we need to be able to look at the, the opportunities to use technology. We need to cut out the waste that we, that we may have. And again, that's in, in the supply chains and how can we, we be uh, rewarded for that? And again, I think uh, as well, then it's looking at, you, you mentioned about the supply chains and how can we have that pull through maybe for, from consumers as well, or consumers valuing the products that are being produced in, in a particular way. And we have examples of that across the, uh, across the region where we have processors paying a premium for an environmentally uh, aware of farmers doing particular environmental things on farm. They pay a premium for that product incentivize the farmers to be able to, um, uh, to to do things and invest in the environment on farm and they're prepared to see a premium for that and you mentioned I think Bruce mentioned about leaf and leaf mark and we're seeing things that are done through through farm assurance on uh, with red tractor as well so I think there are things that, that, that the farmers can do we can drive, use innovation to be able to drive some of those things around productivity and being working much smarter in where we are to be able to do that. And like I said, I feel we shouldn't be um, definitely not running, running faster to, uh, to stand still, but we need to look at the resources that we have on, on farm and, and the soil, soil and water that we have are uh, a key to be able to, uh, to do that. And I think I say it's quite exciting. We've got people that are interested in taking some of this forward, a lot more interest now in relation to soil science. I think the innovation that's, that's there again is, is key. So really, I think that was making me point. I think sometimes a lot of the, the farmers that we talk to, when we talk about increasing productivity, straight away they jump to it's producing more. Well, we're, we're just, you know, what I mean, we've been on that gravy train or that treadmill for many, many years, and that's not what it's about. But it is around how we can actually get. Um, I suppose it's the the productivity amount is the ratio of your outputs versus your your, your inputs that are, that are going in, and how can we use, uh, like I say, data, technology, innovation, to be able to uh, to to drive that. And I'm very keen that we can take things to the set from other sectors, other areas to, uh, to do it. And some of it is, is true innovation um, and, and, and taking things that maybe haven't been done before, but some of it is, is taking things from other sectors, other areas, and how can we move much quicker by applying it here as well. So yeah, key on the, key, I think it's a, it is a real opportunity for us to do that. I feel there's a, a, a carbon or a net zero benefit as well. And is that a key issue for you as well, Bruce, just in terms of using that data and technology to, to tie into that productivity agenda? Is that something that, that your work ties into? Yeah, definitely. And um, I think there's also something here about, uh, say about um, the innovation for other sectors. There's a, there's a common language that we need as well. You know, say I, I come in from an electronic engineering point of view. 
if you talk to a um, uh, an engineer about a plant, it tends to be a big steel thing that makes chemicals. It's not a uh, not a green thing. Um, and so, so, so you know, it's, it's a trite sort of comment, but it's uh, but it's true because um, I, I find it fascinating. I mean, here's an example: we, we we're working with Sony. Obviously, they 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 produce consumer electronics and music and all the rest of it. Now they're working now on um, on on farming. Now it's a totally different sector to them, but they've come in because they've got Internet of Things capability. You know, the bit, this, this whole thing we hear about everything's going to talk to each other. Your fridge is going to talk yeah. to your cooker and all this sort of stuff. Um, yeah. So, so they've got that capability. Um, we started working with them and say, okay, let's uh, let's start looking at um, a, a crop disease surveillance mechanism. Just by dynamic maps of how you can create monitoring for diseases. So you do that and you start saying, well, black box idea sounds a good one. How would you do it? Uh, you then realise that um, the way that plants respond to fungal pathogens is actually driven by uh, a lot of the the volatiles that actually release, uh, and so that's what that causes a lot of the pathogens to grow in certain ways. And it's very subtle how it does it. So you say, okay, well, brilliant, that sounds good. And then you say, well, well how are we actually going to generate one of these things? So we've been working with diapers. So we've basically gone straight across and actually said, there's a biomaterial. Well, how do you make a cheap biomaterial? Well, you take the same breathable type materials that you use in diapers. So we've been, we've been working with nappy material to make biosensors. Um, and then bringing in air freshen technology, the way that you actually formulate chemistries into that. Uh, and so all this sort of thinking is now drawn, drawn in some of the big boys, you know, BASF are now interested. And so you say, okay, well, so we've gone from consumer electronics to open up into a different area of agri. That then starts to make the more, I suppose, um, conventional agri industry wake up to what's possible. And then, of course, you then hit that thing about, well, it's not just about techie people having a common language and talking amongst each other. You've got a different business model. Because if you're creating things which um, are disruptive and actually going out there and changing the way that people can actually get data in and use that data, um, then your businesses aren't going to be the same business after. So you've got to have the commercial people who've got the now to go, actually, <laughs> you know, you never wanted an MP3 until you had one. You know, it's that sort of thing, isn't it? You know? So I think there's, a, there's definitely something about getting these different skills to actually, um, I mean, we all talk about multidisciplinary research. But there's a difference between that and getting somebody from a totally different sector to chat in a corridor or a, in the days when we used to be able to go to pubs, you know, uh, on a, you know, sit there and actually have a, have a pint and actually chat about, well, why, what is the things that keep you awake at night? It's a fascinating conversation when you have two different disciplines coming in together like that. And the more we can do that, the better, because that's where you get the really interesting innovations coming out. Thank you for that, Bruce. Uh, just finally, before we finish, we just had a, a final question on the Q&A uh, panel from Richard Bond. Uh, just to say, has any of the panel any experience of programmes like the government's Made Smarter Fund, which looks to support smaller businesses with support advice and grants, uh, and do such schemes work? So, David and Bruce, either of you, is that something you've experienced or have knowledge of? Yeah, Bruce, John. Do you want to go on that? I mean, basically, where, where we are, we, we, go on, Bruce, go. I was about to say, I mean, the, the, uh, the Made Smarter programs, obviously, around, um, are all driven very much by the manufacturing end of things. And so, very much, yeah, that thinking that the manufacturing world's had about just in time manufacture. Uh, we, you know, in the Northwest, we've certainly been looking at how, uh, how we can do a grow smarter. And that's part of the thing about the Net Zero North bid that's gone into Comprehensive Spending Review. It's the idea that we can apply those same way of thinking that Made Smarter has, has done with the SMEs and try and do the same with the agri-industry and looking not, there's, there's a real pain when, the, when the, the agri world seems to consider that the farm gate is the end. Uh, you know, we, you've got to be thinking across the complete, uh, complete chain. Um, and so that, that linkage between the Made Smarter Tap initiatives, what they've been doing with the SMEs, to what we can then go, do um, in the primary production, I think needs to be made. And, that, and uh, you know, we've been talking about this for a while, haven't we, David, in terms of what yeah. we can be doing in the northwest of that. Yeah, no, and that's why I said there is, we feel there is opportunity. And again, we've been speaking with the, uh, with the team at Myerscope 
to see whether there's opportunity to be able to uh, to put something together to be able to deliver for the uh, for the food and farming sector on a on a gross on a yeah made smarter uh, basis and can we apply it across the food and farming? Well, thank you both for that and Richard. I I hope that answers your question. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap things up there, and I think your comment, Bruce, about um, the need for the farming community to to realise that that things don't just end at the farm gate is actually it's going to be one of the key challenges going forward. You know, not just producing commodities, but but linking in with with the whole agenda, whether it's around net zero, climate change, or or whatever it might be. I think is is going to be a huge challenge for for agriculture going forward. Um, there are huge challenges for agriculture in the county, but we have a fantastic county in Lancashire. We, we have a, a wonderful landscape and a unique agricultural economy as well, which, as David alluded to, can, can do the whole gamut from upland farming to out on the coast and the cereal and, and horticulture production we, we do out there. And I think today has been a, a fascinating chat around that and the future of the industry and how innovation ties into that. So for me, um, thank you to you, David and Bruce. And I'll now hand back to, to Dan just to wrap things up. But thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for that. It was uh, incredibly interesting for, from a non-agricultural point of view to listen to, to, to you, you gentlemen describe the industry and some of the real good lessons there about learning from other industries and picking up uh, lessons. But I also get the impression that there's probably a lot that other industries can also learn from agriculture too and agri-innovation. So thank you for that. And thank you for joining us from this call. And just quick to reminder to everybody that's left on the call that we've got one more session tomorrow. I've just popped it in the uh, link there, a vision of the future for Lancashire in respect of innovation. So I hope you can join us that. But uh, once again, to Ben, to Bruce and to David, thank you all gentlemen for your time. Um, we appreciate it and we'll end the session there. All the best and hope to see you again soon. Goodbye for now. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye.